so you have discussed it. Let's discuss uh, yes, Dickness Mercy, and who else? How many want to contribute to Pastor Debbie? Three, uh, Dickness Zimbo. Four, yeah, oh, let's put our hands together for Sister Deborah. Yes, five. Okay, my beloved Angelina there. So I, I seal it with the five so that we can quickly go just after it. So contribution from, we discussed chapter, I was not here when we discussed that chapter five. One to, one to seven, you know. I tried to, did I try to start it the other day, the song of the vineyard? And what is it all about the song of the vineyard? So you just pick, anyone that you can pick before your timekeeper, yes? Two minutes. Okay, let me, let me give you two minutes. Because we are doing all, whatever you can pick from chapter five to the end, just pick. And I want us to speak louder, uh, louder and do. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome back, mommy. Yes, I welcome myself. <laughs> for Your time is going, you know. <laughs> right. Um, Isaiah chapter 5 talks about the song of the vineyard. Verse 1 is very, I love verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, God mentioned there that he has loved us with an everlasting love. I so much love that scripture. Here again, in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 5, God is reiterating his love for the human kind. And if you link that with John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish. Our God is a God of love. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Now, if we go down, God put so much into the vineyard. And what happened was expecting to get a crop of good grapes, but mm -hmm. it yielded only bad fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking from an agriculturist perspective, God was sort of in a very frustrating situation because he, he put in so much, you know, as a farmer, you are out there in the, in the weather, whether it's rainy or God it's cannot wood. be frustrated. Let me change that. But like God was not happy. God was not happy. Mm -hmm. Thank not you, Mommy. Frustrated this situation. Can't be frustrated. Amen. God cannot be frustrated. Mm -hmm. God wasn't happy with the situation. Not but not God had invested so much into his people, but he wasn't getting the, the, the fruits that he wanted back from his people. And uh, verse 3 talks about the uh, dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah. So that's what typified the Christian um, people as of today. Now, if we move swiftly to verse 5, it says, Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. So because God had put so much into the vineyard, to the people of God, and he wasn't getting the fruit he wanted, that what happened? So he was going to take away. I just ran off. Is that two minutes? Let's go round up. Okay, I will be rounding off now. Mm -hmm. So I said we'll be taking away the, the hedge. If you look at Job chapter 1 verse 10, when um, the sons of God presented themselves before God and Satan came along and he was saying, God was so proud of Job. And Satan said, oh, because you put an hedge run about him, run about his household. So even today, when we are faithfully serving God, God protects us and shields us as well as our own household. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Amen. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. I'll just read all what I've jotted down in the notes. Isaiah 5 verse 7 was talking about the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. So I wrote down here, I said the church is God's vineyard and the believers who are the children of Judah and Judah means praise. And we cited that from the book of First Peter 2, 9, where it says that you are royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people. You are, sh you have been called to show for the praises of God who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous kingdom of light. Because here it says the people of Judah are the vine he delighted in. And I wrote here that we are the garden, the garden of the Lord to reflect the beauty and the glory of the Lord. But God was disappointed with what he saw in his church. The hand of his people were filled with blood, assassinating the characters of their fellow brothers. There was no justice. Justice was taken away. Proverbs 21 verse 3 says that the Lord, if we can quickly just say, to do what is right and just 
is more acceptable than the law than sacrifice to the Lord than sacrifice to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice and God is a God of justice so God wants the church to do right in his sight at all times and from verse 8 to the end talked about the woes woes and judgments of different lifestyles that God observed in his people Israel. And here I wrote, I said, the wrongdoers who are the wicked cannot escape the woes and the judgment of God. Every act of man in this world have both earthly and internal consequences, whether good or bad. And verse 8 was, mm, let me just round that up. Verse 8 says, Woe to you add houses to house and join field to field till no space is left and you lived alone in the land. So we can see the covetousness that the people displayed here, greediness of man. And I wrote here, I said, don't be greedy, selfish or self-centered. Be contented with what you have and don't covet, covet other people's property or possession. Okay, just round it up there. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'll just uh, touch on verses 3, 5, and 6, if there is time. And what I wrote here is that from verse 3, God, the owner of the vineyard, demanded a come from the Israelites. So I said God now reversed position. For example, I would say by calling on the Israelites to judge themselves. So I said this is a really similar akin to the parable of Nathan when he told King David about his sin with Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 15. So God does, in verses 5 and 6, showed God's anger on the vineyard because his hard labor produced uh, fruitless and useless grapes. So I said, may we produce good fruits. And as we are blessed with that, we should bless other people. And again, I said, God said he will inflict punishment in verse, in verse 6. He will inflict punishment on them for misusing and abusing what he has given them. For example, he said he would, uh, we say white beast will eat the vineyard when the hedge is taken away. We can see how God protected, um, how he removed, uh, God said he will remove his, prote his protection, his presence and power from them. And they will be left naked and helpless and their enemies will be able to tread upon them because his Shekinah glory has been removed from them. So we will not encounter such. So and I said, due to the sins, uh, due to the sins, the question I just asked was, I said, what is the implication of this verse 6 on rains? Most of it is not applicable to us in Christ, Faith of an Church, hallelujah. But the implication of this, um, of this in verses, uh, according to verses 5 and 6, is if there is no spiritual rain, because we saw in verse 6 that God said there will be no rain. So if there is no spiritual rain, we know that rain, when rain falls on plants, it eats fruits. So the spiritual rain is the Holy Spirit. So if there is no spiritual rain of the Holy Spirit, the people might gather in the church, but the Lord might not be in the midst of them. May it not happen to us. People might gather to pray, but their hearts might not be sincere. Leaders, preachers might be preaching. Most of it, like I said, is not applicable to us in Christ's faith of an church. But we are just talking of we are time of... <laughs> <laughs> Then number, yeah, number four. Thank you so much. Let's put our hands together for us. Um, what stood out for me was um, verse um, two that says, um, he dug it up and cleared it of stone and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but he yielded only bad fruit. I remember the first time we went through it, mommy gave us a scripture in the book of Matthew 7, 20, that says, um, by their fruit, um, you will recognize them. And then going forward, um, in John 15, um, from verse um, 5, really kind of explain in depth, from verse 5, it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in him, it will um, bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is saying that 
for us to be able to bear good fruit, we have to be connected to Jesus. Um, he has to be our source of supply. And then verse 6 said, if anyone does not remain in me, it's like a branches that is thrown away and wither. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. So which means anyone that, that does not bear fruit, um, Jesus is going to cut off that person off. So this is a reality that we need to check what kind of fruit are we bearing in Christ if we say that we are children of God. And then um, verse 7 says, if you remain in me and my word remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. So again, Jesus is said this is a promise for us when we remain in Christ, what is available for us. So which means we need to study the word of God according to Joshua um, one seven that says that study the word to show thyself approved and um, um, I forget the rest of the scripture and then <laughs> verse A says that this is my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourself to be my disciples so for us to bear good fruit we have to be Jesus' disciples let's put our hands together please. Um, so when I, when I read back um, Isaiah 5, obviously it says it was uh, the song of the vineyard, but like the songs I'm used to singing or we're used to singing quite happy and it starts off happy, but it gets really intensified and sad and what I was, what I was particularly drawn to was just the magnitude of like God's anger. Um, when we check it, when we see at verse 25, it says that the mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. In 17, we see that the lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. So like the normal civilization that we know of will be reversed once the Lord is exalting his righteousness to those who do not regard his word. And in verse 30, we see that in that day, um, he will also lift up a banner for the distant nations. So that judgment will also reverberate, not just in that land, but across. And um, he will see darkness and distress, and even the light will be darkened by the clouds. And... Yeah, I just saw that there will be no mercy for those who fall under the wrath of God. Um, even in verse 14, it says the grave enlarges its appetite and opens its mouth without limit. It's just, I don't know, it was just a harrowing reality that once you fall under the wrath of the Lord, there's no escape. You know, we hear of the mercy of God enduring forever. But at this stage, we see that it actually comes to stop because there's no limit. So I pray that we will always be in regard and reverence the Lord, that we may not fall under this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's put our hands together. That is really wonderful. I'm telling you, I just want to quickly, quickly insert something here. Yeah, don't forget to put your hands together. That is wonderful. Who can actually tell me one of the, who can actually tell me one of the scriptures that actually pointed out this, uh, uh, pointed some things out from this Isaiah chapter 5. We read it. It's in Isaiah too. Isaiah, Isaiah, we have read it, Isaiah. You just tell me, you, you have to take the microphone and speak it straight so that I can, yes, give it to, it's not sexy, but we, if you can confirm it, I'll, I'll take it. Yes, you tell me, you are saying some, yes, and what is the, yeah. The, the last few verses, verses that talk about the way we dress, the way we conduct ourselves and all that. Yes, that's what I read of children, and they did what? Don't forget it, you know, because you can mark that. It's one of the... I read of children. He said they rebelled against me. And what is going to happen to them? He said they will have uh, boils from their head to underneath their feet. Is it not happening today? Parents rearing of children and children rebelling? But you keep on praying for such children. Amen? Amen. After you doing everything, God lavished everything that this vineyard needs or needed. To, to, to flourish and look good. Is that not us? Is that not describing us? God lavished wealth, lavished everything upon our lives so that we can look great and look good for God. But instead of looking good or producing good fruits, we are producing bad fruits. So if I may ask us, what type of fruit are we producing as God lavishes 
his wealth upon our lives. As he lavishes his wealth upon our homes, as he lavishes his wealth upon our children, as he lavishes his wealth upon our husbands, promotion upon promotion on individuals, gaining good jobs and everything. So what kind of fruit is God happy with us as he lavish or lavishes his wealth upon our lives? I want you to have that question because I actually wrote it in my, because we can keep on judging here, you know, because in that chapter, because I'm not going to say everything all over, but he confirms who the vineyard is or was, if you have to relate to the children of Israel, and is to us. He said, the, uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, he said, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. You can also compare it to us of today. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but had distress. Is God distressed about the wealth that he has lavished upon our lives? Is God distressed, seen distress instead of righteousness concerning the things that he has done for us? I want us to go back to that chapter 5 so that you'll be able to, I'll be able to really show it to us because I was not, uh, I was here but I didn't say everything. As I began to sing a song to the one that he loved, and the song is about a vision that God has given to him about the vineyard. And he said, I will sing for the, for the one I love, a song about the vineyard, my loved ones. Loved one, that is the God that he loved, amen, had a vineyard on a fertile hillside, not just on any land, but in a fertile, that is, on a land where God had lavished his wealth, where God has put everything, the good, the best manure he actually chose. So God is always choosing the best for us. God is always lavishing the best on us. Like parents, we give our children the best education, the best everything that we, they, they, they want to have. It all now depends on them to make use of that. He said on a fertile hillside, he dug it. God did, he even dug it by himself. He did not give it to any laborer. He chose to do it by himself and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vine. Now he planted the seed, good seed God planted in us. Look at how devil, what devil did to Eve. This is exactly like Adam and Eve, if I would compare that. He put them, when you read, go back to that Genesis. He talks about several rivers. Talks about vegetation and everything that he has used to decorate these two great people that he first of all created. Very well. Like God raising us, planted us in a good house. Like this church. This is a good place. We have enough food to eat. We have everything through the man of God that he has brought to us. We have everything. He said he's given us everything for uh, uh, something and godliness. Uh, uh, life and godliness, yes. Second Peter chapter 1. So how are you helping God in the wealth that he has lavished upon you? Let me talk to an individual now. He made preparation of a bountiful harvest. He planted, like, like a farmer, planted yam and wanted to produce big, 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 fruitful yam. But instead, the yam comes very little. You can't have such uh, uh, land to, 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 to produce good fruit. He said, I planted it with choicest vine. He built a water tower in it. He even put watchman. God planted in a good house and put good pastor to pastor us. In a good house, put good father to give us good education, to go, do everything. Put watch, uh, a watch tower so that somebody can be watching. So that somebody can be watching. And cut out a wine press as well. Dog a place where the place it will bring good uh, wine. So when they rip the grave and everything, then we can get wine. Something that will give us satisfaction in every level. Because wine actually brings satisfaction. So when you have abundant wine, what happens? You'll be able to drink enough to be refreshed, isn't it? 
And, that, and for that reason, God did all these things for us. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruits. So what type of fruit do you produce? I will, I will just say that. Are we producing good fruits or bad harvests? God made provision for everything for us. Created a big banquet so that we can come and eat. How many of us in the church are coming to the Bible study? And how many of us are coming to the Bible study, yielding good fruits about this Bible study? Do we go out there to be talking about the, this Bible study? Or we go out there to, to mimic and then, look, what is this teaching? Or, you know, there are several ways. Or an I don't care attitude. Eh, I watch it at home. Guess what? It's only meant for people that are not members of church. People that are members are supposed to be here. Not watch it at home. And be lazy about it, getting interrupted by telephone calls and all the rest of that. Then you are a bad harvest. You are a bad harvest. So what type of juice or wine grapes are we? Are we releasing wine for many to drink or bad wine? Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Now ask God's people to judge. If you are to judge with what is going on in our community, our home, and in the church of God today, how do we judge? Are we good uh, grapes, producing good wine, or bad grapes? What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? What else do you want me to do? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield bad? Now I tell you, what I'm going to do to my vineyard. Nicholas Messi was actually telling us there, and uh, uh, Pastor Debbie said, I will take away its edge, and it will be destroyed. May God not take away its edge from us in the name of Jesus. That's what you see happen. People that are flourishing and things are happening, God is protecting them. And doing now God has taken off his edge. And then you begin to see the results. May God not take off his edges from us in Jesus' name. If you made reference to the book of Job, go and read about the book of Job. You know, when God put his edge around Job and everything was flourishing, look at what the devil came to do. But I pray in Jesus' name that the Lord will not take off his edges from us. And it will be destroyed. <laughs> God is loving, but God also judge. I will break down its walls. He's not only taking off the edge. It will the walls with which he has used to Put, it will break everything. Everything will be left bare and empty. May we not be empty in the name of Jesus. And it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. <laughs> when one becomes a wasteland, get what happened. Today you are serving God, tomorrow you are backsliding. Or you backslided. What happened? That's why you say somebody has gone into prostitution. Let me talk in our own language now. That's why here, uh, somebody has become husband snatcher. Are you listening to me? You will become a wasteland where anything can enter. You, do you know when you look at the, 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 the discovery channels and everything? When you look at wasteland, what happened? The cars, lions, you know, he, 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 he talked about it in the following, but when we get there, I'll be able to remind you. They will come to be eating and destroying one another. May we not be a wasteland in the name of Jesus. Release for different kinds of praise. He said, neither pruned nor cultivated. Because now you don't come to church anymore. You are not being fed. Nothing is happening to you. You become a wasteland. And jackals come into you. Different kinds of people. You become a talkative. You become a gossip. You stay at home looking for other people to pull into sin. That is what you become to do. Because you have become a wasteland. May we not be wasteland in Jesus' name said, I will command the cloud not to rain. Even that, that is, you see, there's something about, you know, when I read this, the word of God that came to me was in the book of Acts. He said, when they received the Holy Spirit, what, there, there was a time of refreshing. Read that book of Acts, maybe chapter, one of the chapters there. He said, put it on the screen if you can, if you can get it. Out. He said, there was a time of refreshing. You know, this time that we are having together, I said, you see, I'm telling you, I missed all this, even though I'm enjoying the crusade. But, I, you know, my heart is here. Because this is so much well. Amen. The time of refreshing. 
He said, I'll make it. But if you get that book of Acts, chapter, between chapter 1 and chapter 3, when Peter had finished ministering to the people, he said they were time of refreshing. So if you become a wasteland, there will be no rain. No time of refreshing. Rain refreshes. You know, the other day, my gardener planted this uh, little, that comes like tulips, yellow and different colors and all that scented thing in the garden. And it seemed they were not coming. He said they need rain. Because I saw that ones that have really come up. And I said, why is man not coming? I want the colorful hillside here in my garden. And he said to me, it needs rain. So when I read things like this, I understand. You can be a Christian if there is no rain. You are hearing the word of God that is not refreshing. God is, Holy Spirit is not refreshing you. Then you'll be dry. You'll be like a wasteland. May that not be a portion. In the name of Jesus. Look at that. Let's read it together in that book of uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, right? This was the full verse. Repent. Yes, read it because I can't see it properly. Let's read it together. That is it. So the sins of these people will not cause time of refreshing to come. No rain. Cloud all over. They will not be clouded. Now he now uh, told us the right, the right, the, 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 the meaning of this uh, song that he has been singing. He said, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is a nation of Israel. The people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. There are people that are supposed to bubble. People of Judah, praise. You know, people that are supposed to be praising, loving God, and doing nice, nice things. But instead, the more God is looking, they are doing bad, bad things, bloodshed, gossiping, eating people by, the, by, by bad things, from biting and all that. These are more than bloodshed, more than stabbing people with a knife. Discouraging people that want to go to heaven. And taking... You know, may the Lord help us. He said, and he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but had cries of distress. May that not be a portion. What he's saying here, the more God lavishes his love on us, the more we should love him. You know, the scriptures say, for God so loved the world that he gave God, his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him will not what? Will not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through his son might be saved. So we must make sure that this song of the vineyard is not going to be sung about us. Fruitful song will be sung about us in the name of Jesus. And because of all these things that has happened, God began to de declare several woes. I'm trying to type up these things, but the more because I've done so much today. Declare several woes that will come. And we are reading this thing so that we can be warned and don't fall into all these woes. Deuteronomy 28 talks about it from verse 15 to the end. Talks about the woes that if we refuse, according to chapter 1, to follow its command and everything, which will make us to be blessed in the city, blessed everywhere, we do the great things, manifestation will be happening to us, every open and all the rest of that. But if we refuse, now began to talk about the reason why these woes and judgment will be coming upon them. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14 talks about the things that will happen to them, the good things, if they do God's will, if they obey God, if they obey his command. said anything they lay hands on will be blessed. But these people, because of their sin, because they have not followed that pattern of Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14, he said these are the woes. There are six woes. And these are the condemnation. There are six condemnation. Number one. Number one sin. Verse 8. 8 to uh, 10. He said, woe to you who added house to house and joined fields to fields till no space is left. And you live alone in the land. He said, woe to the people that are guilty of wealth, acquiring wealth. You know, here I can be mortgage. You are a mortgage person. You want to give people mortgage. And you are taking people's money into your pocket. Mortgage, you did not do for them. Things are not happening. Do you understand? Acquiring other people's wealth and keeping it to your own wealth. Like in Nigeria, people will buy land. 
and then you acquire one land and you sell it. You take the money, you don't give them the land. Fake. Or, as a lawyer, you help people to sell. And then they've given you your 10%. Then instead of giving the money to them, after eating the 10%, they give you all the documents and everything. You kept this in your pocket. It's happening everywhere. This is number one woe. You say woe to them. This is the judgment that is coming upon them. You people that are greedy, you know, uh, exploiting others. They will not be such people. They are in the church. That is the number one woe. So if you know anyone that exploits other people, you are like, oh, please help me. I need money. I'll pay in six months' time. I'll pay in five years' time. Even not of, I'll pay in two months. I pay. And they really, when they give you that money, you borrow it, and you are not paying back. The Bible says, whoa. It's happening. Even in the church of God. People come and deceive other people. Don't worry. I have a business. I want to put this money and everything. You know, they trusted you. They didn't sign any document with you. So you better know now. Sign documents so that when anything happens, you have to take them to court. To sort it out so that they learn their lesson because God is not happy about that. And this must cease in the household of faith. It must be simple and plain. Bible says, woe to them. People exploit other people. Number two, woe. Is seen from uh, verse 11 to 17. Let's look at this number two, woe. Talks about drunkenness. He said this drunkenness even occur in religious or Christian celebrations. <laughs> Let's read it together. What to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, to, to stay up late at night, you know, going to bar places and drinking beer and all the rest of that. Say woe to them. Till they are inflamed with wine. They are intoxicated with wine. They have herbs and lair as their uh, uh, banquets. Pipes and trimbles and wine. But they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord. No re respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger. And the common people will pass the thirst. When you are doing celebration or partying, you know, religious parties, celebrating anniversaries, celebrating weddings, all these festivals that we celebrate. May the Lord help us so that we don't get drunk. Ah, well, which, what is the quantity? Well, I was in a party the other day and I learned that some people brought wine. They can't put that. Ah, you don't fear God. May the Lord help us. So that if you have them among us, you must be able to tell them. Tell them the Bible says here, because lack of knowing the word of God makes us to misbehave sometimes. But if you can show them, show me where it is in the Bible. It says we should not be drunk. That's what it says. But Proverbs 31, 4 to 5, put it on the screen. Only to the foolish do you understand to drink wine. Amos chapter 6, we read about it. Chapter 5, to, uh, chapter 6, verses 5 to 6, talks about something like that. I quoted them here, Psalm 28, verse 5, Job 34, 27. You know, you, you know one thing that he said about these people that are drinking wine. He said they now, you know, they now drink wine uh, in, uh, 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 as, and use the, all these things that the musical instrument that we use to honor and praise God, and they use it wrongly. That is in, in church things that you do. You gather together as believers to celebrate, and then you are getting some people drunk there. Or you are getting some people representing God in a different way, all in the name of drinking, drink, uh, getting drunk, or just messing around. Say, I'm not drunk. I can manage myself. What do you think about this thing of God? And yet they're not drunk. You know what I'm saying? God is right, is right to them. Chapter 5, 18 to 19. You know, let's, let's, let's finish this said that. But had no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hand. 
Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger, and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore, death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend like nobles and masses, with all their broilers and uh, revelers. So people will be brought low, and everyone humbled. The eyes of the arrogant humbled. But the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice, and the Holy God will be proved by holy, proved holy by his righteous acts. And the Holy God, uh, yes, then sheep will graze as in their own pasture. Lambs will feed among the reen of the rich. May that not be a portion in the name of Jesus. And from verse 18 to 19, talks about another woe. On those who mock God by continuing in their sin. What is this? I can always forgive you. What are you talking about? God is not as rigid as you are thinking. Well, you know, mocking God. Mocking God. Because of time, I'm not able to go into the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 1 that talks about the mocker, the fool, and the other person, the other third one. Mocker, fool, and uh, simple, yeah. You know, I taught it in this church. The Lord will give me the grace to talk about those three cultures of people. Don't worry, the simple. God understands. God can forgive the mockers. Uh, who is our possibility? <laughs> that your pastor. Are you sure that he's doing the right thing? <laughs> the foolish. Who are the foolish? Don't you say there is no God? You know, I'll teach on those when time permits me to do that. So he said, woe to those who drew, who draw sin along with courts of deceit. Take pride in sinning. He's talking to people. Courts of deceit, you come up, show good to everybody, but inside you is poison. And wickedness as with cut rope. You know, you draw sin. Take pride in sin, in sinning. To those who say, Let's, let God hurry. Let him hasten his work. So we may see, see it. Uh, if your God is God, like Pharaoh, you understand? I can do like a God or anything. You take pride in sinning. He said, the plan of the Holy One of Israel, let him approach. Let it approach. Let it come into view so we may know it. What you know already, you mimic it and you talk against it. Those who take pride in sinning, they tell that this is sin. Uh, if God is God. Uh, if he knows that I've sinned, let, let God do something for me now. Because God doesn't act like in those days. <laughs> he's full of compassion. But when he's acting, that's when some of us are sorrowing with people. Amen. Amen. You take pride in sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. When God will deal with that sin, it can lead to death. Huh? I was carrying my sister to stupor the, uh, in Nigeria. Because I was looking for something. I didn't say, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> She's elderly. They go, don't get in her 40s anyway. I say, uh, <laughs> my sister, my baby sister, I'm talking. No, 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 not, not the immediate, not my immediate one. That one is uh, older. The baby one, the baby one. 40, 40 something, sir. Mid 40s. Mid 48 or something. Because at the time, Auntie, my own thing now, we can take it. I say, you must be joking. Dead. Death, you know, until you scare us too much. I said, I'm not scaring you. Because I cannot be looking for something, I can't find it. Okay, we have to look for this thing. I said, because my auntie, now I'm my auntie sometimes. Because tell people that I say, my auntie is serious. So, so let's look for this thing because <laughs> you must, you must have permission. Because one of my sisters, that one you tell me, it's another second to the last baby. He said, I have to let people build a house for their sister. People do this. Your own is too much. I said, it's not too much. We'll take anything from you. Use my computer, you must ask. It's as serious as that. Don't take it for granted. Because when things are happening to you and I'm praying, so that I know why I'm praying. <laughs> she, she was so scared. She was so scared. So that I said, I said, ah, until you remember that this year or something, you gave it to me by yourself. Oh. So, <laughs> so that when I see it, I don't challenge. Yeah, because you have to tell them the truth. You have to tell them the truth so that I don't just, because they want to use Oboju for me like a bold face. Yes, and use bold face and say, after all, we can take our sister's thing. We can use her, we can take my, you can't take my shoe. You must ask for it. 
then I give it to you. May the Lord help us. So, in Christendom, there are some things that we take carelessly. I'm trying to tell you so that we must take them seriously. I have to, uh, Apostle Williams can always forgive me. No. What if you don't, you don't even stay for that opportunity to say, you are sorry, and then you die? Are you listening to me? Yes. Let's take God very seriously. No, don't take pride in sinning, and you continue to, and expect the grace to abound. So we have talked on the third, right? The, 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 the fourth uh, woe is, uh, let's see that one. The fourth one is from verse 20. He said, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their sight. That is, yes, 20, is that not the one? I'm, okay, no, no, no. Woe to those who call evil good. And good, evil, people, deception, that is what he's talking about here. Who, poured, uh, who put dark, darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? May such will not come upon us in the name of Jesus. What is it? It's people that are confused of moral standard. Uh, God just, you know, uh, to put, uh, to put two earrings, is it bad? Is to put you here, is it bad? Ah, to do these crazy styles that they do for her, is it bad? You know it, but you just want to prove a point. The Bible says, woe to such people. Ah, ah, what is bad in putting color here? What is bad when my hair is colored? Is it not, but is that the right? Even when you're allowed to put ordinary wig, do moderation, that's what is talked about it. Moral standard, God, there is woe to it. Who put, you say, people that are misleading people today, you are putting color on your hair. Other people say, ah, Mommy Omar is not talking, so we can always put this color. Some people say they will be hung. They put hang a big stone on your neck, then you'll be drowned. May that not be a portion in the name of Jesus. He just, we are, I've told my women now, you know, all this, my Diana, is Mary Magdalene now, that will be wearing length 34. You understand? Because there is no more length 24. Length 28, No. Maybe I can permit uh, 30, 30, 34, and then Mary Magdalene, which is 36. The Lord will help us. Because all these moral standards, we must keep them. You cannot expose yourself or you come out. What is bad in this legging to wear this legging? And then the whole of your pant is traced out. Moral standard, you are taking good for bad and bad for good. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter may the holy spirit explain it to us in a, in, in in the right way in the name of jesus people that cannot distinguish able to distinguish between right and bad you know it but you just decide not to may god help us in the name of jesus so what is the next woe? The fifth? Is it the fifth woe? The fifth woe. 21. Okay. What does that one say? People that can deceive other people conceited. These are the people who woe to such people. You must not be wise in your own eyes and clever in your own sight. You know what you have done is bad. Apologize and forget about it. Don't, don't keep on insisting and say, as far as I'm concerned, there is nothing like as far as I'm concerned. Yes? Who claim to be wise, but they are foolish. James chapter, uh, Romans chapter 122. What does that say? You can write it against it. James chapter 1 verse 5. And you can write down James chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 1, verse 5. What does it say? Read it there. I can't see it properly. James 1, 5. James 3, 17. Yes. To 
claim to be wise. They are, they are in, in not impa uh, impartial. They are, they are impartial and they are not sincere. It was foolish. Let's look at Romans chapter 122. That's the fifth, uh, the fifth woe. Yes, Romans 1.22. May that not be a portion in the name of Jesus. The sixth woe. Let's look at the sixth woe. 22 to 25. What is the sixth woe? 22. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. You know, 11 to 17 talks more about this. People that love to pervert justice. Heroes are drinking wine. And champion at mixing drinks. <laughs> Who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore, as tongue of fire lick up straw, and as dry grass sinks down in the flame, so their roots will decay. That's the punishment that is coming upon those people. And their flowers blow away like dust. To 25. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spawned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Take God's word. It is talking to the disobedient now. The punishment, God is describing the type of punishment that will come upon such people, which is Deuteronomy 28, 16 to the end. The punishment for disobedience and the consequence of sin. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake. And the dead bodies are like refuse in the street. Did it speak about that from the beginning, chapter 5, through verse 6, or something like that? Let's take this word very, very seriously. And the Lord will help us. Say, yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. He lift up a banner for the distant nation. Don't just take rest and say, oh, God is, uh, just be like the simple and this. God is forgiving. God, God is love. God, you remember I said he lavished his love first. But because people have taken God for granted, then all these woes will come upon them. Six woes. I'll be asking you about these six woes. So go read more about them so that I can be able to describe it in your own way. And then he said here, his anger is not going to just stop like that. He said he lift up a banner for the distance nation. That is, this message is to be sent to many nations. And which we are part partaker of the, of, of the message today. It's not only stopping during the time that it was written or spoken about. But it should be raised as a banner, a standard for everyone to hear. And thank God we are partaker of hearing this today. That we should let the people know he whistles for those at the end of the earth. This confirms how God acts. He said he whistles. So that we can hear like the shepherd whistles. And all the sheep will hear. The shepherd dog will go pursue them. The one that is going astray and everything. Do you understand? So God also whistles. Amen. May we hear God when he whistles to us. He said he will, he will continue to destroy those who disobey him. That is what he's saying. Whistle. He's still whistling today. And what he's doing through me tonight is whistling so that we can be able to hear more. We are the distant land, the nations. Whistle and we are hearing. And when God whistles, what happens? When we hear, the army that he whistles, that as he's whistling, the, 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 those tough people, that, has, that arrange themselves for destruction because everything is set up. That is what is going to be happening here. Here they come. He said, as they are hearing the whistling of God's judgment, the people that are to judge, those angels of death and everything, they are coming. 
They will be coming from everywhere. They hear that which to say, here they come. Their army will respond very quickly. He says, swiftly and uh, speedily. That's why you see the destruction of some people when it just comes. Who like, ah, how come? He's a nice person. He's the, he'll be talking. That person has gone under the wrath of God. May we not go under the wrath of God. Because once God acts like this, it's like a whistle. And it's going to be attracting. Because God's judgment has been, de- he said, if you do this, this will happen to you. If you do that, you know, like, he's first of all lavish his love. Let's not li- wait for that wrong whistle. The, when a whistle is in two parts, but I, I'll put it in two parts. That's a whistle that is whistle of love. Amen. Things will be acting in our life. The edges are not taken away. Uh, the, the land is not laid bare, and all these things are not happening. But this second whistle, if we continue to go against God, he said all the army that the devil has hidden in their different places, they begin to come out. They say swiftly and steadily. They will come very quickly. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumber or sleep. Not a belt is losing at the waist. That is, the army are ready for war without any hindrances. The enemy that God set in place, that, that, that the enemy set in place, you know, to, 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 to do havoc, they are set in place. They are not just tying their, their, their shoelaces. They are not just putting their belts to fix on. They are prepared for battle. Amen. Amen. Not a sandal stripe is broken. That is, they are... They, their shoelaces are ready. Their arrows are sharp. They've prepared for war. Amen. Amen. All their bows are strong, are strong, are strong. I don't know the, the strong, strong, or strong, or whatever. Anyway, let's look at it in another version so that we can be able to hear. S T R U N G. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their chariot wheels like wild wind. That is, they go faster, those wheels. They don't waste time to come and do that hard work for the disobedient. The roar, their roar is like that of the lion. When a lion roars, what happened? He has seen a prey. Then those prey for the devil has been exposed. So, the, 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 their roar is like the, that of lion. When they catch an animal to eat, what happens? They start to roar and all the rest of that, you know? They roar like young lions, and the young ones will be coming to eat as well. They growl as they seize their prey, that is, carry their prey away, and no one can deliver or save it. <laughs> You know, they will not be a prey to the devil. And God himself, you know, because God can't see sin. God turns his eyes away and he's like, <laughs> this godly person is being destroyed. May that not be a portion. And we are cheered. Do more mistake to do another mistake tomorrow. We are telling him, say, no, I'm not. No, I don't think I can anymore because the enemy had hold on that person because of sinning against God. Carry it off to one to rest uh, and no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over it. That is over what? Over the enemies. Over their enemies. The lion, the devil will now roar over over the enemy. If anybody put themselves in front of that enemy. Like the roaring of the sea. Of the sea. And if one looks at the land, there is only darkness and distress. That is, there is only fear, and everything is clouded. Even the sun will be darkened by the cloud. May that not be a portion in the name of Jesus. You can write these scriptures down, the book of Luke 21, 25, because that's verse 30. Isaiah 8, 22. Jeremiah 4, 23 to 28. And Joel chapter 2, verse 10. For Jeremiah, f- uh, for Isaiah 5, 29. Zechariah 11, 3. Isaiah 10, 6. 
Isaiah 10, 6, Isaiah 49, 24 to 25, Isaiah 42, 22, and Micah chapter 5, verse 8. I rest my case. May you not be exposed and devoured uh, by the enemy, but continually enjoy the wealth that God has lavished on us. In the name of Jesus. Always remember we must not sin against God because he so much loved us that he lavished his love upon us. And children, don't disobey parents because they lavish their love upon you. Make sure anything they tell you, you do, you don't go against them. As I once said, I reared up children and they rebelled against me. For this purpose, God was telling them the sins that will come upon them. Let us not rebel. Because rebellion leads to what? Destruction. We will not be destroyed by God. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. <laughs> Just add this. If you are willing and obedient. Well, <coughs> we are going to pray. Let me just say before we pray, two things struck me very strongly when mommy was teaching you. I have read the scriptures several, preached from it years. But one of the things I was teaching before I left, which I intend to continue, I saw more strongly here. You know, the consequence of fruitlessness. The consequence of fruitlessness. In the book of John 15, Jesus began by saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. The branch that does not bear fruit, my father will cut off. Yes? But then he says here about fruitlessness, he says, he says, now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away hedge. Okay, I will take away hedge and it will be destroyed. And then he went further to say, that's the vineyard is the church. Yes, there are many churches today, the hedge of God has been taken away from them. Then he says, I will, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and brass and thorns will grow, th grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. And the vine and it went to say, tell us that the vineyard is the house, and the 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 uh, the vineyard is the house of the Lord. Sorry, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah the garden. Now it's. It, 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 it gives us the reason why tragedy strikes some believers. Because when the age is taken away, that means that the person will be fit, praying and fasting, but if the enemy decides to strike, there's no protection. And tragedies will happen to Christians. The second thing that really baffled me is verse 13. <clears throat> it says, therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding they are men of ranks will die, that is ministers, of hunger and their masses will be, will, will be parched with thirst. Therefore, grave or hell, the word grave means hell, enlarges his appetite and opens his mouth without limit. Into it will descend their nobles, which are ministers and masses. So many Christians are going to hell. Currently, as I'm talking to you, many ministers already who died are in hell. Many believers who die are in hell. Really, the church of God on earth today, we established on this trip, and I'll tell you just one brief, that it's most likely that 90% of those who go to church today are going to hell. You know, because of the fact that they ignored the laws of God. This trip in Nigeria was incredible. It was short, but very decisive. Now, I won't talk about the minister's meeting, but 
The crusade we had was three days, and it was held in a place called Agege Stadium. I've known Agege since I was born. Uh, it's one of the most prominent uh, uh, cities in Lagos. But I've never known that Agege has ever been 95% Islam, and Christianity had never penetrated Agege till today. It really shocked me. When they told me, I thought it was a joke, when we got there, you can see mosques everywhere. You rarely find churches. Even while we were ministering, they were shouting Allah behind us, the skull there. So when I was told that it is, it is a city that is hemmed in and out by Islam, which means that it is not easy, almost impossible to have somebody saved. I told the team that this is where I love because people who, are, who believe in Islam, two things, uh, Islam and the uh, idol worshippers, only two languages can break their power. One is a deep knowledge of the word of God that is beyond any doubt. The Bible says they all came to hear him and to be healed. You find that in the life of Christ in Mark 1 and also in Acts 8. But the second thing that, you know, speaks loud is miraculous signs and wonders. So, um, one of our members here uh, has gone home, I think about four or five members of the cathedral went on this week. They never told me they were coming. I just saw them, you know, there. And I said, <laughs> you guys have shocked me. Because they never told us they were going. They have gone. Some of them went when we were going. Even a, a team of them were on the same flight back. We didn't even know that they were on the flight. So, but she took a driver to drive her to the crusade ground. So while they were going to crusade ground, the driver asked her, where are you taking me? Where am I taking you? He said, oh, I, I get in stadium. He said, what are you going to do there? He said, oh, we're having a crusade. He said, another one. He said, you are all liars. He said, I am a strong Muslim. Do you hear me? He said, we are looking for where they worship God. It's not in Nigeria. That's what the man said. The man said, every church in Nigeria is a company. Their ministers are thieves. He said, because he had been to several churches. All of them are the same. In one service, they may take four offerings, five offerings. They will be saying God said somebody should give somebody should give X amount. He said he, he really categorically said that the God God cannot be found anymore in this country. Now Muslims recognize that Christians are the ones who know God. Okay, but this is a Muslim saying that the people who know God we want to go to them to know God, but they are they are useless. We are better than them. Are you with me now? I have received the text from the chief Imam of Abuja some years ago, who watched my program when we were in Abuja. And the man wrote to Pastor Fashuba, and his text goes thus. He said, um, formerly, we imams watch Christian television or go to Christian churches to know the message we will teach in the mosque. When the ministers speak, then we go to the mosque to know what to teach them. He said, but... A time came that every message in television turned to money and demons, and we did not have message anymore in the mosque. He said, until I stumbled across Apostle Alfred Williams' message. He said, from the day that I stumbled across his message, I will cancel any program at the time he'll be preaching. And then he said, please thank Apostle Williams very, very much for the messages that he preaches. And he said, if he continues to preach this way, all Muslims will become born again. Then he ended by saying, beg him not to change. Okay? Well, it happened that our television program in Nigeria is watched by top Muslims and even the Emir of Kanu and the head of all Muslims in Nigeria, Sadana of Sokoto. And this is what brought me before them. But this man said, when he came, he packed. That well is the same thing. So, but when he packed, he said he began to hear the message. 
and he decided that uh, this I'm hearing is not Nigerian message. So he came out of his car and he sat at the back of the cru of the crusade. And you know, at the time I gave out a call, he was the one running in the front, coming out to accept Jesus Christ. Now, this man, this man, the second day, the second day, uh, the sister got another taxi. He was a Muslim. They were coming. He asked the same question. And the woman said, uh, it's all lie. All these people, it's money they are looking for. When you get there now, it's money, money they'll be raising. So she also, the man also got to the stadium and parked his car. Okay? And uh, then he came out during the message. Then I gave a call. The second man was in front. Okay, so the two Muslims that carried him were in front. So, but the issue about this uh, first man was that on Sunday, he, he came in first day, he got saved. Second day he came, third day he came. And on Sunday he came to the church. You know, because he's a Muslim and he's a very, you know, hardcore Muslim that will pray five times a day. You know, those Muslims who pray five times a day, they argue anything and you can't lie to them. They don't lie to anybody. What they are is what they tell you. They are better than many Christians. If they hate you, they will tell you, I hate you. And that's nothing you can do. If they love you, they will say, I love you. They don't dilly dally. So when the man came to the church, <laughs> at the end of my administration, the man said, excuse me, sir. <laughs> you know, he's not uh, a Christian who knows the other service. I said, please come over. And I gave him a hug. He said, can I say something? I said, yes, take. Unedited. You will hear what he said. But anyway, the crusade was an open eye, but it was incredible. People were saved. People were healed of various sicknesses. Really, it was painful that the third day, people were just hearing. Because one who came went and told another. And at that time, we have to call it a quit. So next year, I have announced to them that we will have a crusade in Nigeria, in that Semagege Stadium, but now for 14 days. And the way we're going to do it is that the medicals, please write it down. They will be going ahead of me. They will set up a tent. We will, we will contact every medical institution in England that we should. I will start working on this personally too from this month so that we can... My intention is, of course, we, I will get the British Embassy involved, very, very actively involved. Medical Council of Great Britain, I will make contact with them. So that we will go there with as many medical experts as we can. We will get the van, you know, this, um, the Cancer Research Bureau, like we get a van like they have. And uh, where they can have a mini operations like cataracts and all stuff, mini minor things you can do. And we will go there a week before where people will come and do checkup, medical checkups, get referrals, and we will make sure that we connect them with um, some benevolent hospitals in Nigeria. That is hospitals run by Christians who also help people so that those who, are, who haven't got money could still be treated. If we cannot, if it's something major that they need to go to the hospital, and we can give them a referral and stuff. So that we will do one week just helping the people give them clothes and stuff and take care of them. Then we will start our crusade on the on the third day so that our crusade will run for 10 days. The I Islam will come down Amen. in that place. Islam will come down. You know, my crusade format is not always good for three days. When I did the crusade in 79, I had I in 89 I was in one spot for 90 days. And that 90 days, people started coming from like Glasgow. People started coming from Kano. They brought sick people from Kano. This one, we have people from Padakot, from Nasarawa. Our Nasarawa church came, you know, with uh, members and the uh, youths, really. They were just all over the whole place. And we have people from Republic of Benin. About six or seven pastors came from the Republic of Benin. We had people from a place called Badagri, Ijebu, and all over the whole place. People came, and the news was just spreading when we had to stop. It's very, very painful. But whatever it is, maybe I tried to change my flight, but 
The airline told me you can't. <laughs> the airline said you can't. So when the airline said I can't, I said, well, God wants me to be back in England. So, But it is a beginning of great things. And Pastor Dapo told me yesterday when we arrived, um, I we called him and he said that I've called all, all those who are saved today, myself. And he said that that Muslim, I, I told him that, you know, when I called him, he said, ah, Papa. He said, no, it's not Papa. It's uh, his pastor here. <laughs> ah, he said, your voice looked like his voice. He said, it's my dad. He said, oh, no wonder, no wonder. He said, I am coming to church. You will see me. I'm coming with people. I'm not coming alone. He said, now I find God. I'm coming and I'm coming. You will see me at the time. So there are many people like that. So what I met you, mommy was sharing with you, really, you know, the message that she has for the church, she will share with the church. What she's showing you, I tell you this, for fact, majority who go to church today are going to hell. For fact, I'm 100% convinced. Because people have lost the understanding of what salvation is. There are some statements Jesus made, which I will take you through in church, okay? Which in law, we will call such statements, you know, dictums. They are statements that cannot be changed. You know, they form the centrality of reasoning. And Jesus said this statement very black and white. Like he said, not all who call me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father. Okay? He gave many parables where he really said that Christians will be caught down and be sent to hell if they do not obey the scriptures. And of course, the scriptures have been maligned and been changed to many people which many people go to church today do not know the truth. And ignorance of the truth is no excuse. So what you have learned today, and of course not just today, all what you have been going through in Isaiah, is talking about whenever you see Israel, he's talking about the church, born again church. And whenever you see, uh, he talks about Judah, he's talking about Christians as individual. But when you get to, go and read this with it, uh, these two scriptures, the book of Revelations, there are two churches that the book of Revelations particularly made mention of. We'll, we'll cover all this on Sunday very, very deeply. The church in Sardis and also the church in Laodicea. And the danger about the church of Sardis is that these are the words of him. Uh, you know, well, it says, um, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. That's Pentecostal movement. But you are dead. Okay, I told them about the difference between Pentecostal and and um, and um, Roman Catholic. How Satan destroyed Roman Catholic, he has destroyed Pentecostal on earth worse. If God was to check religion, Roman Catholic people will be more accepted by God than Pentecostal movement. I am telling you the truth. I am telling you God's truth. But you see, the fact is that they still have this feeling that we are. <laughs> when I spoke with the ministers, tears rolled in eyes. Because when I teach, I talk about practicals, you know, I show you things that are real. So <clears throat> that is one church we're going to look at on Sunday. The, then the second church, which is the Laodicean church. This is the church that it says, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either of the other or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spew you out. Now, it says, you say I am rich. That is the hardcore Pentecostal prosperity church. It says, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. That is the language of prosperity preachers. But you do not realize that you are rich, wretched, you are pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That is so powerful. We'll look at that very detail. You know, people can think that they are. This what Pentecostal people are. These two churches just give us a full picture of Pentecostal churches. Now, I'm sure that those of you who are watching at home, you have been blessed. I'm going off here in a few minutes. May the Lord bless you. Say your same time in Christ with Abanakut Cathedral next week Tuesday. God bless you and see you.